all are fully and equally members of Christ's body, Christ's assembly, and Godhouse, 1 Timothy 3.15 and Hebrews 3.6, and when the last trumpet blows and our Lord returns, the entire structure will be united in resurrection to join him in his triumphal return, 1 Corinthians 15.50-54 and Revelation 19.14. It is wrong to think, therefore, that the early Gentiles, the Jews, and the Church are somehow different in any important way. Together, we are all one body in Christ, for He has broken down the barrier that separated us. So remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh, called uncircumcised by those of the so-called circumcision which is fleshly and man-made. Remember that you were without Christ, alienated from the polity of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, for he has made both Jews and Gentiles one and has broken down the middle wall of partition that is, the enmity between us, by discharging the law of the commandments and its requirements with his own body, so that he might recreate the two into one new man by making this peace, and might reconcile both in one body to God through his cross, having by means of it abolished the enmity between God and mankind. For when he had come, first advent, he proclaimed the gospel of peace to you who were far away from God, and peace to those who were near. For it is through him that we both have our access to the Father by means of one Spirit. So then, you are no longer strangers and hangers-on, but you are fellow citizens and fellow members of the household of God, established upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ himself the cornerstone, in whom the entire structure is in the process of being riveted together and is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you too are being built up into a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 The Uniqueness of Israel it should not be overlooked that in the preceding passage, Gentile believers of the present day are portrayed as having become part of the household of God along with Israel, rather than replacing Israel. This picture is consistent with every other passage in the New Testament where the issue is discussed. The Gentiles are the wild olive branch that has been grafted into the natural olive tree Israel, Romans 11.13-24. through 24. The truth of the matter is that the church is composed of Jews and Gentiles, and that Jewish believers are the foundation for the holy building that God is erecting, not only in the Jewish age, but in the church age as well. All of the apostles of Christ were Jewish, and although the New Testament is written almost exclusively in Greek, the dominant Gentile language of the time, all of the writers of the Bible, New Testament as well as Old Testament, were Jewish. Though many first-century Jews rejected the gospel in the same way that their Judean countrymen had rejected their own Messiah, even a cursory reading of Acts and the Epistles demonstrates clearly that Jewish believers were both the original foundation of the church and continued to play a huge role after the influx of the Gentiles had begun. Jewish believers not only exist, but have played and continue to play a critical part in all generations of the church, Romans 11.5. For the gospel is theirs by first priority, and ours, as Gentiles, by the grace of God, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, that is, Gentile. Romans 1.16 The hardness of the majority of the line of Israel during the church age has been since Paul's day a heavy burden on the heart of their believing countrymen. Romans 9, 3 and 10, 1 Jesus himself mourned their lack of belief. Matthew 23.37, and predicted these times of the Gentiles, which comprise the two millennial church-age days, when Gentiles would flood into the kingdom while Jewish belief would be reduced to a trickle. Luke 21.24, compare the wedding banquet parable where those invited fail to come and others are brought in instead. Matthew 22.1-14. In the case of the resistant majority, Two issues always seem to lie at the core of this resistance, which is in such stark contrast to the preeminence of Israel in matters of faith, both in the past and in the prophesied future. Refusal to accept a suffering Messiah, 
Matthew 16.21 through 23, and John 6.66. Compare the desire for displays of miraculous power instead of the cross, Mark 8.11 and 12, and consequently tripping over the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and the offense of his cross, Romans 9.32 and 33, and Galatians 5.11. Resentment over the inclusion of Gentiles into the family of God, seed of Abraham by faith alone, Matthew 27, 18, Acts 13, 43 through 45, and Romans 10, 2, and corollary to this, trusting in their own righteousness from the law instead of faith, Romans 9, 30 through 32. This second issue is very much a post-cross problem. Jesus' earthly ministry was focused entirely upon Israel, not the Gentiles, so that our Lord's contemporaries never had this excuse. They rejected him before believing Gentiles became an issue, Matthew 7, 6 and 10, 15. This hardness in part of Israel is destined to continue until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, Romans eleven twenty five. that is, until the calling out of the mass of Gentile believers is complete, a process characterizing the church age and a process that will continue and be completed just prior to the second advent of Christ. At the moment of his return, everything will change for Israel, and the vision of him returning in glory will bring about a profound and glorious change of heart. Zechariah 12, 10 through 14, and Revelation 1, 7. Despite this general hardness, during the last phase of the church age, when the Jewish age overlaps with it for its final seven years known as the Tribulation, Israel will once more take the lead in spectacular fashion. Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, will be resuscitated for a warning ministry of the greatest significance. These are the only two Jewish age believers of whom we know whose bodies were taken by God for precisely this purpose. Deuteronomy 34, 6 and the final worldwide witness of the gospel and God's warning of impending doom will be carried to the four corners of the earth by 144,000 Jews. Revelation 7, 1 through 8 and 14, 1 through 5, thus partially fulfilling through Jewish hands the prophecy of universal evangelization, albeit as an indirect witness in the case of the Gentiles. Matthew 24, 14 compared to Revelation 14, 6 and 7, the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy. The millennial glories of Israel and her undisputed prominence when the son of David returns to rule the earth as her king show clearly the pride of place that Abraham's seed enjoys in the plan and family of God. The preeminence of Israel can also be clearly seen from the description of the eternal state in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. The twelve gates of New Jerusalem, named for the historical Jewish capital, are named for Israel's twelve tribes, 2112, and the twelve foundations of its wall are named for the twelve Jewish apostles, 2114. And the Messiah comes from Israel, John 4.22. We should never forget that Christ is Jewish, the seed of Abraham, the vine of the vine of Israel, Psalm 80, 8 through 16, the branch of David's line, Isaiah 4, 2, and prophetically, the light of Israel, the light of the world, Isaiah 42, 6. Therefore, while it is true that Gentiles are Jesus' other sheep, John 10, 16, that they have been made one with Jews in Christ, Galatians 3, 28. Compare our brotherhood in Matthew 23. 8. That the barrier between the two groups has been broken down through his cross, Ephesians 2. 11 through 21. And that there will be many from the east and the west who will recline together with the Lamb at his victory banquet, Isaiah 25. 6 and Matthew 8. 11. Christians of Gentile stock need to understand that we are Israel's spiritual seed. Revelation 12. 17. And sons of Abraham by faith. Romans 4. 11 and 16. For we are a wild olive branch, and it is the root of Israel which bears us, not the other way around. So even if some of the branches have been broken off, and you, wild olive branch that you are, 
have been grafted into their place and have become a partaker of the rich root of the natural olive tree, don't boast over those branches. For if you boast, remember that you don't support the root, but the root supports you. Now someone may say, branches have been broken off for me to be grafted in. True enough. They were broken off because of their unbelief, and you stand secure because of your faith. But don't think arrogant thoughts. Rather, have a care. For if God didn't spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. So consider God's mercy and severity. For he is severe towards those who have fallen away, but merciful towards you, if, that is, you continue in that mercy. But if you don't, you too will be cut off. And if they don't continue in their unbelief, they will be grafted back in. Romans 11.17-23